Welcome back again, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo Montgomery here. China History Podcast, Episode 249, The History of Xinjiang, Part 6. The China History Podcast is brought to you by nobody in particular, but if you'd like to be the sponsor of such a popular, long-running family program as this, contact me here at CHP Headquarters. Find me at the website at teacup.media. Imagine the prestige and respectability your organization or company could garner affixing your name to the CHP. Ten years old next week, June 9th. So, let's finally get to the Tang Dynasty. I can't believe it took six episodes to get here. The father and son co-founders of the Tang, Li Yuan and Li Shermin, they were perfect examples of Han Chinese elites of their day who were filled to the brim with Turkic sensibilities and a familiarity and appreciation of the culture and having all this understanding in their back pocket like they did allowed them to build a special kind of bond with the Eastern Turkic Kaganet. You remember, of course, from late in the game last episode, the Turkic Kaganet, founded by Bumin, broke up into East and West at the start of the Sui Dynasty in 581, founding Emperor Wen Di, having a bit of a hand in the breakup. Sui Wen Di, Sui Yang Di, and now Tang Tai Zong, their ability to know their northern Gurk Turk neighbors allowed for a, a different style of relationship than what we saw with the Han Dynasty and the Xiongnu, uh, for example. This made it much easier for the early Tang rulers to insinuate themselves inside the political struggles happening to the north, and using their familiarity with Turkic ways, their culture, their politics, and language, of course, well, they were most effective in manipulating events to the maximum benefit of the Tang. Let me lift a quote from James A. Millward's Eurasian Crossroads regarding the embrace of Turk culture by the Tang elites. Quote, Chinese historiographers argue that the Northerners had thoroughly been Sinicized, but it makes more sense to say that the Chinese aristocracy was Turkicized. Many members of the Tang court displayed many Central Asian and steppe influences, riding horses, speaking Turkic in preference to Chinese, and playing polo. Tang elites also indulged in a passion for Kuchian music, for Sagdian whirling dance, and for the exotic Western goods brought by Sagdian merchants. One Tang prince chose to live in a yurt and would offer guests chunks of roast mutton carved off with his own dagger. Tang music was played on the lutes, viols, and percussion instruments of Central Asia and India. Tang poets sang of infatuation with Western dancing girls. For these and other reasons, the Tang period was one of imperial China's most open and cosmopolitan, end quote. The Tang prince mentioned was Taizong's oldest son, Li Chengqian. He was the older brother of the Gaozong emperor. This one-time crown prince goes down in history as the royal in the early Tang court who really embraced Turkic culture in a wildly enthusiastic way. Now, he got caught by his father trying to usurp the throne, and his career went all downhill from there, and he was gone by 644. Gone in the sense of departed, like the Martin Scorsese movie. This affinity for all things Turkic started with, some say, the greatest conquering emperor China had seen since Han Wu Di. And this, of course, was Tang co-founder Taizong. So early in his reign... Soon after the incident at Xuanwu Gate, covered in CHP episode 129, Gurkturk soldiers were carrying out incursions into core Chinese lands south of the Wei River, right up to the gates of Chang'an, the capital. They rattled Taizong's cage and forced him back on his heels, and he had to resort to appeasement to keep these northerners at bay. By 629, however, when this Tang emperor saw all the infighting going on in the north amongst the eastern Turks, into the fray he jumped, allying himself with a pugnacious Turkic vassal of the eastern Kaganet called the Xueyentor. And this Xueyentor alliance 
allowed Tang forces to launch an offensive against the eastern Turkic Kaganate. The Xue Yantuo were based in northern Mongolia on the Russian border, south of Lake Baikal. And by the year 630, the Tang army, with the assistance of these Xue Yantuo Turks, put an end to the eastern Turkic Kaganate at the Battle of Yin Mountain, that's in present-day Inner Mongolia. With Taizong's starting lineup of generals participating in this campaign, and with eh, so much local knowledge, military smarts, and diplomacy, well, before long, the Tang court was calling all the shots up in this eastern Turkic Kaganate, and it stayed this way for eh, almost half a century, lasting from 630 to 682. Besides Tang China, the Xue Yantuo turned out to be the big winners, filling the vacuum of the lands lost by the Eastern Turks. Sooner or later, the Tang military is going to have to deal with them too, and by 646, the Xue Yantuo were put away by the Tang, with a little help from their new friends, who we will look at in more detail next episode. You may have heard of them. These were another group of Turks called the Uyghurs. Now, the only other thing I want to mention about the Xue Yantuo was that it's believed, not by everyone, that the Shatuo Turks may have splintered off from them. From past CHP episodes, we remember the Shatuo Turks for their role in assisting the Tang Dynasty to crush the Anlushan rebels and for their role in the later demise of the Tang and the various successor states they formed in the wake of the fall of the Tang. That was during the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms era. So having these Gurk Turks in the north in their back pocket proved extremely useful in the bigger picture that was on the mind of the Tang Emperor. And this was the same old China dream going back to the Han Dynasty, that being the takeover and control of the western regions. Xinjiang. The Sui already had a minimal presence out there, but not in a big way. Those lands were at that time decidedly dominated by the western Turkic Haganet. But no matter, the Tang rulers were able to utilize all the soft power and diplomatic tools at their disposal, and in order to project some influence and power out there, they used the tried-and-true He Qin system and other forms of coercive diplomacy. We looked at the He Qin system a couple episodes ago, you know, marrying off one's princesses for the sake of peace and amity. The Tang rulers knew very well what kind of wealth and strategic value the western regions contained. If they knew this in the Han, of course it was a hundred times more so in the Tang, and Taizong began eyeing the west early, and these eastern Turks who he had recently subdued, and many of whom now served him in the Tang army, they were going to come in handy as mercenaries in his armies. The whole story of the Tang domination of these western regions, modern-day Xinjiang, you'd be surprised how few of these people fighting and serving out there were Han Chinese. Most of the Tang generals who fought, and certainly most of the soldiers, overwhelmingly all Turks. This whole enterprise in Xinjiang that ran hot and cold from the 630s to 790, about a century and a half, the Tang military pretty much subcontracted all their wars out to these Turkic people from the steppes of Mongolia and Kazakhstan. They were the ones who wrote most of the history of Xinjiang between the 7th to 9th centuries. And with so many Turks serving out there, doing all the heavy lifting for the Tang generals, well, if you ever wondered how did so many Turkic people end up in Xinjiang and west of the Xinjiang border... It all goes back to this time. By the 10th century, the days when you mostly saw Indo-European, Indo-Iranic people were starting to wind down. To cover every battle and broken alliance and all the names of all the leaders of so many Turkic tribes, honestly, it'll make your head spin. Yet, this was the story of the Tang experience in Xinjiang from Taizong to Dezong. So I'll try to tell it as best I can. Between 632 and 640, the Tang army, along with their Turkic allies to the north, steamrolled into Xinjiang and began warring with the Western Turks for control of the cities and kingdoms. 
And one by one, the Tang forces, chock full of these Turkic soldiers, and 632 took the cities of Kashgar and Khotan, then Yarkhan in 635, and Gaochang in 640. Gaochang, up in the Turpan Basin, well, that city, just below the Huayanshan, those flaming mountains discussed last episode, it became a administrative center for the Tang Protectorate of the Western Regions. It was quite an important place in its day. You could still visit the ruins of Gaochang and the Astana Cemetery, where all these Han Chinese settlers and administrators had their final resting place. Don't miss that on your next visit to uh, Turpan. Gaochang, also known as Karakoja, and many other names, is a place we'll keep hearing about throughout this series. It's one of the most important cities as far as China's presence in Xinjiang during the uh, Tang went. So after Gaochang had been taken by Tang forces, it got a name change to Xizhou, and it served as the first seat of the Tang Protectorate of the Western Regions. And this will be the first permanent, it was meant to be permanent, Chinese military presence in Xinjiang. Two prefectures had been created, this one in Xizhou and north of there in Ting. Ting Prefecture, modern Jimsar County, will become important later on as one of the capitals of the Uyghur state in Xinjiang. It will also be the site of the protectorate set up during Wu Zetian's time. And the Tang Protectorate in the West was just one of the Tang Protectorates. They had a lot of military adventures going on. The dynasty also maintained protectorates in Vietnam, Korea, and Mongolia. From this, Shizhou base in the Turpan Basin, established during the time of Taizong, the Tang armies started to plan the takeover of the rest of Xinjiang on the other side of the Tianshan and the Tarim Basin. Perhaps the most notable fighting name from this time would be the Turkic general whose soldiers did most of the clobbering. This was a former Eastern Kaganate royal prince named Ashur Na Sha'ar. That's his Chinese name, of course, in the Turkic languages of the day. They didn't pronounce it that way. Through a complicated concatenation of circumstances involving his armies holding territories in Xinjiang, Ashur Na Sha'ar, in 635, had submitted to the Taizong Emperor, and for this act of loyalty he was given the title of General of the Left Guard, and to show how much importance and value the Taizong Emperor placed in Ashur Na Sha'ar, in 636 he handed over his own sister, the Princess Hung Yang, to be this conquering general's lawful wedded wife. Starting in 640, the Tang army started their takeover of Xinjiang. It didn't happen all at once, and once they had it, they didn't hold on to it for too long. Gaochang, now renamed Xizhou, became an important base of operations to carry out military campaigns south of the Tianshan in the all-important and strategic Tarim Basin. Now, after Gaochang was taken in 640s, the armies of Ashur Na Sha'ar started to go after the parts of Xinjiang that hadn't submitted to Tang China. Now, the first kingdom over the Tianshan Mountains to the south was Karasar, modern-day Yanqi. Karasar had opted to ally themselves with the western Turkic Kaganate, so it took a long time, and I can detail all the skullduggery that went on. But let me just say that Ashur Nasha'ar's army subdued them in 644. Next up after Karasar to the west was Kucha, Chiotsu, always the same places century after century. They too, in 648, a year after the passing of Taizong, well, they opted to surrender with minimal resistance. But then after submitting and with Ashur Nasha'ar, out conquering elsewhere, the leadership in Kucha had a change of heart and switched their allegiance back to the western Turkic Kaganet. Then they turned on the Tang generals base there, Guo Xiaoke. Guo, with Ashur Nasha'ar, acted as the tip of the Tang spear in the Tarim Basin takeover. Well, he was seized and killed by the Kuchens. Ashur Na Sha'ar and his army of a hundred thousand rushed back there and violently beat this kingdom back into submission. 
and for defying Tang China and killing Guo Xiaoke to teach the inhabitants a lesson, 11,000 of them were executed and decapitated, and several parts of Kucha were also razed to the ground. Draco from 7th century BCE Greece would have been proud of that kind of punishment. In all of Xinjiang, this Kuchen kingdom, as I indicated last episode, was known as the most cultured and splendid of all these oasis states. After getting raked over the coals and devastated by Ashurnasha'ar's forces, this Indo-European civilization, with all its Indian influences, never again came back in its historic form. And like a lot of these ancient cities over the 8th and 9th centuries, started to become less and less Indo-European and more Turkic in their makeup. And like I said, after the 10th century, it was hardly recognizable to how it had once been prior to the Tang Dynasty. Over in Khotan, on the other side of the Taklamakan Desert, they got so frightened after hearing what happened in Kucha, they sent representatives post-haste to Chang'an to show fealty and beg not to be laid waste by Ashurnasha'ar's troops. A temporary setback had hit the Tang a few years before in 645 when some more muscular leadership emerged up in the eastern Kaganet, and they began to push back hard against Tang dominance over their affairs. It was always like this. Chinese domination, followed by some pushback, and then back to being friends. So it had been, in large part, thanks to Taizong, that in no time at all, the Tang military was highly dependent on these Turkic warriors like Ashurnasha'ar to fight their battles. And this included against the Western Turks, and in Korea as well. From here on out, Tang military history will be written in good part by generals and heroes with Turkic names. An Lushan, the Tang general and government official who will rip the Tang dynasty apart with the rebellion he'll lead a century later, he was half Turk and half Sogdian. Ashurnasha'ar was so useful and loyal to the Taizong emperor that when he died in 655, a half dozen years after Taizong, he was buried next to the emperor. Taizong's mission was to conquer and hold the oasis states of Xinjiang's basins, and it was left up to his son, Emperor Gaozong, beginning in 648, to organize and consolidate these fruits of victory for the dynasty. In order to manage the whole Xinjiang operation, he called for four garrisons to be set up in strategic locations around Xinjiang in Kucha, Khotan, Kashgar, and Karasar. These four garrison locations were called the Anxi Sijun, the four garrisons of Anxi. Anxi, that means to pacify the West. That's what this is all about, pacifying this region west of China, building a buffer between China and Central Asia, and of course, getting a piece of some of the lucrative Silk Road trade and commerce. For about a century and a half, these four garrisons spread out around Xinjiang, manage the entire enterprise out there for Tang China. And not only in Xinjiang, even beyond the borders into the great trading cities of modern-day Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And those places, too, for a brief time, anyway. And just as Han Wudi and his successors, through a strong military presence, ensured peace and prosperity along the Silk Roads, here again, in Tang China, Thanks to a winning combination of a strong military and capable leadership at the top, China promoted a period of peace and stability that facilitated an ideal environment for trade and commerce in Xinjiang to thrive like never before in Chinese history. And as I mentioned, cultural exchanges were taking place on an unprecedented scale in Asia. Chang'an had joined the likes of Carthage, Rome, and Constantinople as another historic city where people from all over the known world, who had the means and wherewithal to travel, came to. And this capital of so many past Chinese dynasties was turned into a great entrepot of trade, as well as a place where the diffusion of 
intellectual ideas and knowledge also took place on a grand scale. The Gaozong Emperor, like his father, had big plans for the Western region, and his Turkic allies were going to be indispensable for the operation of this Tang Protectorate to pacify the West, the Anxi Duhufu. With the establishment of the Protectorate initially in Gaochang and then later in Kucha, where it stayed for most of the time, well, for a short time anyway, 7th century Tang China was the dominant power in the Tarim and Turpan basins. But as more and more ethnic Turks began to migrate in the direction of Xinjiang, support for the Tang Emperor, starting around 651, was becoming diluted at an alarming rate. Because of the cultural and familial ties, the loyalties of these Turks, based now in Xinjiang, began to turn to a new, strong leader who emerged in the mid-650s. This was Ashurna Khelu. Ashurna. Remember, that was the ruling clan of the Gurk Turks going back to the founder, Buma. Ashurna Khelu was a former Turkic general in the employ of the Tang, who had struck out on his own and had been able to rally and unite the Western Turks. And he started battling the Tang forces and taking back what had been lost to China during Taizong and Gaozong. So beginning in 655, the Gaozong emperor had to do something once He Lu's military incursions started affecting the edges of China proper and Gansu. His first campaign against He Lu didn't fare too well, but the second that was launched in 657, that culminated in the Battle of Ertish River, easternmost Kazakhstan, that one succeeded, and that Turkic threat in the west was neutralized. After being defeated, Hulu had been able to escape to the west, to Tashkent, but the people there, in that present-day capital of Uzbekistan, well, after considering the possible upside, no doubt, handed Hulu over to the Tang authorities. And Emperor Gaozong well, didn't have him killed, and instead allowed him to live out the rest of his days in the capital, Chang'an, under close watch, I presume. This major offensive against the Western Kaganet that spelled the end of Ashurna Khelu was led by another military figure who was also on the list of other great China generals who came and saw and conquered territory in Xinjiang. This was Su Dingfang. He's doubly famous as not only the Gaozong Emperor's go-to general for Xinjiang, he also served later in Korea as well, fighting against the kingdom of Baekje there. And that was in 660. So once Su Dingfang had tamped down all the fires in Xinjiang, the Tang Empire was again solidly in control of the basins of Xinjiang. The Western Kaganet, with Ashurna Helu defeated, was leaderless for the time being and not as much of a threat. However, one tribe was starting to emerge that would give the Tang Dynasty Xinjiang operation a real hard time. These are the Turgesh. They were another major clan, like the Gurk Turks, Karluks, and others as well. The Turgesh had their own Kaganet for 67 years, 699 to 766. And I could give you names of some of their Kagans if you want. But with the Turks down, but not out... Well, it didn't mean things quieted down for the Tang in Xinjiang. There was something else going on to the south of Xinjiang, on the Tibetan Plateau. The Western Turks weren't China's only threat in Xinjiang. There was also the Kingdom of Tibet. As all these events I've been yammering on about were transpiring between the Turks and Tang China, Tibet's most famous and charismatic leader was at the peak of his powers in the 640s. This was Songtsen Gampo. Now, if you're familiar with the Princess Wencheng's story, Wencheng Gongju, she was Taizong's niece, who, well, if you remember from past CHP episodes, in the He Qin tradition, had been given to the Tibetan king to keep the peace. And much later on, she became a propaganda superstar. Princess Wencheng, the Chinese histories will be proud to tell you brought Buddhism and other aspects of civilization to Tibet. Under Songtsen Gampo's leadership, the Tibetan Empire grew in size and power, 
and when the time was right, they went on the warpath against China. As early as 656, seven years after the passing of Songtsen Gampo, the Tibetan armies were knocking on the door of southern Xinjiang, as well as in Kashmir. And in the year 660, the Tibetans, only a couple years after the Tang armies had vanquished the Turkic forces of Ashurnahulu, they invaded Xinjiang, attacked Kashgar and the Wakhan Corridor. Those of you familiar with the geography of Afghanistan, the Wakhan Corridor is that appendage that sticks out at the northeast part of Afghanistan and splits Tajikistan from Pakistan and separates the Pamirs from the Karakoram Mountains. And just as the Hushi Corridor linked Gansu to Xinjiang, the Wakhan Corridor served the same role, linking Xinjiang to Central Asia along the southern route of the Silk Road. And the tip of that appendage that juts straight to the east touches southwest Xinjiang, and that's right where the Tibetans invaded. In 663, they attacked Khotan, and in the fateful year of 670, at the Battle of Dafei River, the forces of the then mighty Tibetan Empire handed the Tang Chinese army a defeat so resounding and decisive, it spelled the end of Tang dominance in Xinjiang, for a while at least. And this battle was in Qinghai, just west of the capital, Xining, and south of the Gansu, or Hexi Corridor. After defeating Tang China at Dafei River, the Tibetan armies evicted the Tang army and administration out of Kucha, and one by one turned out all the lights for the Tang dynasty in and around the Tarim Basin. The protectorate was forced to move further to the west, inside what is today Kyrgyzstan, and between 648 and 719, the Tang ran their protectorate from the city of Suyab, a former capital of the western Turkic Khaganate, and, if you believe the story, the birthplace of Li Bai in 701. The Chinese called the place Suiye, and it was about 50 kilometers east of Bishkek. Anyway, in 719, the Turgish captured Suyab and the Tang had to vacate. And the Turgish were the dominant tribe who rose to the top of the food chain after the fall of the western Turkic Haganet. But by 673, however, the Tang military was able to regroup and make an attempt at getting back into Xinjiang. And this is still during Gao Zong's reign. And they were able to take back Kucha and use this base to regroup and take back all that had been lost to the Tibetans who had found common cause with the Western Turks and worked with them to put China out of business in Xinjiang. But by 679, the Tang military, thanks to another noted official and general, Pei Xingjian, a protege of Su Dingfang, they had achieved most of their military objectives, seizing back control of the Tarim Basin, lost previously at the Battle of Dafei River. I wish I could tell you the history of the Tang presence in Xinjiang was all nicely packaged and easy to digest, with everything long-lasting, with fixed historical maps and a few marquee names. Well, the sad truth is, at least in trying to understand this history, is that the political boundaries in Xinjiang, starting around the 670s and 80s, shifted as regularly as the sands of the Taklamakan Desert. Unlike before, prior to the Sui and Tang, now there were other civilizations competing with China for control out there, and all of them were equally powerful and advanced. To read the histories is to get lost in dozens of Turkic, Chinese, and Tibetan names, always contending for control over the Tarim Basin. And nothing remained fixed for any great period of time. I'm really glossing over most of the details, and I welcome you to get lost in them and any number of history books. And over in Chang'an, well, not everyone at the imperial court was all gung-ho about holding on to these western regions. It cost a lot of money to conquer and hold on to an empire this big. By the 680s, the end of Gaozong and the start of Empress Wu, there was quite a lot of resistance to keep up the fight out west. After clawing everything back, three years following the death of the Gaozong Emperor in 686, during the reign of Wu Zetian, 
once again, these four garrisons of Anxi were lost. The decisive once and for all end for Tang China in Xinjiang didn't come till much later in the 790s. But by 692, they were still in the game and had been able to re-establish the Anxi protectorate seat in Kucha. Wu Zetian, during her time as China's only woman to rule the nation as empress in her own right, set up her own protectorate in Beijing, the Beijing Duhufu. This was up in the Turpan Basin, where Ting and Xi Prefecture were located. She got this protectorate up and running in 702, a dozen years into her ill-fated Zhou dynasty. This particular Duhufu, or protectorate, had a much smaller portfolio than the Anxi Protectorate with its four garrisons around the Tarim Basin. Wu Zetian's Beijing Protectorate only had to look after the two main ancient cities of the Turpan Basin, Hami and Gaochang, which, as I said earlier, had already been renamed Xi Prefecture. These ruins, by the way, still remain today and are part of the whole Silk Road UNESCO World Heritage Site. The history of the Beijing Protectorate in the Turpan Basin involves a lot of battles with the biggest antagonist of the Tang Dynasty in those parts. These were still the Tibetans. The Beijing Protectorate, by 715, 10 years after Wu Zetian's death at the age of 81, was already getting attacked by the Tibetan Empire and other Turkic tribes. The Tibetans were now bigger and better than ever, more than a century after the passing of Songtsen Gampo. Let's finish up today with General Gao Xianzhi and the famous Battle of Talas, 751. The Talas River flows from the mountains of Kyrgyzstan westward into Kazakhstan, the heartland of Transoxiana. The Tang army was led by this capable general. Don't be fooled by his Chinese name. Gao Xianzhi was an ethnic Korean and was also written into the history books as Ko Songji. Out in Xinjiang, it was always the Chinese military that did the talking for the imperial court, and Gao Xianzhi involved himself with a political dispute around the Fergana Valley, siding with one ruler against another, and ended up being quite forceful in how he handled the situation. And the other side, who had been pushed out by the Tang, went to their allies in Samarkand, the Abbasids, who had just established their caliphate after putting away the Umayyads the year before in 750. Good thing for Tang China. These Arabs had the same tendency as the Mongols, Turks, and Tibetans to savage each other in times of succession. So while they had been sorting out their internal issues... Well, that's what opened up that window of opportunity for the Tang in the mid to late uh, 740s, in the second half of Emperor Xuanzong's long reign. This is how the Tang forces had been able to retake Suyab. So they got to enjoy one last power grab in these rich lands beyond the western Xinjiang borders, mainly in present-day Kyrgyzstan. But in 751, this brief final hurrah for the Tang in Central Asia was finished. These Arab and Persian Muslim forces teamed up with Tang China's greatest 8th century menace, the Tibetan Empire, and these allies combined and attacked Gao Xianzhi's forces. And along the Talas River, Gao Xianzhi's army suffered a sound defeat. This was no minor skirmish. It was written that there were as many as... 100,000 troops on each side involved in this epic battle, primarily fought between the Arabs and the Chinese. A sizable portion of Gao Xianzhi's army were filled with troops from the Karluks, another one of the more powerful Turkic tribes to come out of the eastern Kaganate. Well, these Karluks had always been loyal to the Chinese emperor, and like many a Turk, had served the Tang royal house well throughout the years. But this time... At the Battle of Talas, the Karluks ended up switching sides mid-battle and turned on the Tang army. These Chinese forces found themselves sandwiched in between the opposing Abbasid and Karluk forces. Gao Xianzhi barely escaped with his life. He withdrew from the battlefield and had planned to get his forces back into shape again, but by 755, the Anlushan Rebellion had broken out. 
And Gao Xianzhi, along with all the generals and majors and Tang troops, all had to abandon the mission in the western regions and head east to go help in the fight against the rebels. Anyway, the most famous story that came out of the Battle of Talas, besides it being the first and last time Arab and Chinese armies would meet on the battlefield, was the alleged capture of Chinese soldiers who, well, as the legend goes, were master papermakers. Remember, going back to Cai Lun in 105 CE, the Chinese had been able to hold on to the secret of making that nice paper they did. Well, after being captured at the Battle of Talas, these Chinese masters were brought to Arab-controlled lands, and eh, who knows if the secret was beaten out of them or they gave it willingly, but the 8th century is when the Arab papermaking industry took off, and they became quite good at it, to say the least. And throughout the early and late Middle Ages, the papermaking industry in the Arab world was second to none. Did they steal this manufacturing process from China? Who knows? It's all part of the legend of the Battle of Talas. And though they are already very heavily involved in this history going on, I haven't mentioned them yet. This is the Uyghurs. Next episode, you'll get to meet them and find out from whence they came and the empire they created and their hand in all these events we've been discussing. These Turkic people will play a key role in all the history that transpires in Xinjiang from the moment they enter the picture during the Tang all the way into modern times. Okay, one last desperate plea, a final appeal to everyone racking their brains trying to think of a way to support this China History Podcast program. There's Patreon.com. Okay, okay, you need to keep a payment method on file, but... For a measly three bucks a month, 36 smackers a year, you can ensure I keep this traveling circus going for at least two more weeks. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. There you'll find stories from my unspectacular and wholly ordinary China life. Stories that are utterly unsuited for this quality and respectable RSS feed. But they're all there waiting for you at Patreon. Thank you in advance, though I will... Also, thank you personally if you subscribe. And if the whole idea of Patreon is completely out of the question, well, there's always PayPal. I have a whole thing set up so that all you got to do is go to paypal.me slash China History Podcast and donate whatever your heart desires. Hit enter. You'll have my eternal gratitude. Links to what I just said, all at the website at teacup.media. Okay, Laszlo Montgomery here thanking you for listening and signing off from the quaint little town of Los Angeles, California. And once again, I beseech you, my good-looking and respectable listeners, to join me next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.